values. Sergio, so, so can you hear us? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Well, thank you uh, very much. Greetings for all. Um, um, well, uh, this information can really um, harm um, people and can erode the, the trust that people have on uh, institutions and on democracy. Um, let me um, give you three uh, practical examples of this. In uh, 2018, um, in, in the Brazilian uh, elections, uh, presidential elections, um, it is documented that uh, uh, WhatsApp played a very important role, especially uh, within this uh, WhatsApp groups. Uh, by that time, uh, more than 100, 120 million of the roughly uh, 110 million uh, Brazilians had uh, WhatsApp accounts. Mm -hmm. Roughly uh, two thirds of the voters had um, were active users of WhatsApp, and uh, there was a huge proliferation of um, fake news through WhatsApp groups. And it is uh, believed that this uh, fake news, this uh, fake messages, had an influence in the outcome of the elections. But it's not only in um, democracy and um, democratic processes. Even in real uh, life, in, in the life of the people, this can have an impact. For example, in India in 2017 and 2018, there was a spate of um, uh, mob-related uh, lynchings that, were, that originated in uh, false uh, messages that were circling through uh, WhatsApp. Uh, so people died because they were circling news that there were uh, people uh, going around small villages, kidnapping children and kidnapping people for uh, organ harvesting. Um, there, were, there are also uh, allegations that uh, Facebook uh, played a role in the um, violence against Rohingya people um, through 2013, 2017. Uh, there was lots of um, uh, disinformation about Rohingya people uh, doing all this uh, um, horrible accusations about them. And uh, there is this uh, perception that this fueled violence against them. So, of course, we could give other examples. Uh, often when we discuss these issues, um, the presidential campaign in the United States of 2016 is the maybe the most quoted uh, uh, examples come from there. Um, but there are examples uh, all over the world how uh, fake messages circling in internet and especially in, in um, social networks really plays a role. Uh, in uh, threats to people, to uh, concrete people, and also how it uh, can um, interfere in democratic processes and corroding the, um, the confidence, the trust that uh, people have in institutions. Thank you so much for all these uh, examples that you gave us. Uh, so two, uh, 2018 Brazilian elections and 2017 uh, India mob-related chain messages um, uh, are the examples you gave us, and these are excellent examples of how disinformation can uh, threaten our democratic uh, values. Um, and so um, on one hand, we have disinformation and the threats it poses, of course, and from the other hand, we have the fundamental right to free speech. How do we balance those two? Well, that's a complex problem, and as any complex problem, there are no simple solutions. I'm just saying the obvious. But um, uh, um, not trying to oversimplify this issue, I would say that uh, we should put uh, much effort into um, approaches. One is to support 
foster um, journalistic media. One powerful way of, uh, of uh, not giving so much ground to disinformation is to have journalistic information. When I say journalistic information, I mean information that is produced by journalists according to their deontological codes, to journalistic good practices. And this is very important because uh, what we are seeing in, in some of these places where this information really has an impact is that people are getting information mainly through social networks or through other online sources that are not journalistical sources. Another approach that implements that uh, that uh, is very important to add to the support to the fostering of uh, journalistic media is to um, uh, strongly uh, invest in media in the development of media literacy uh, skills uh, within the population. Uh, it is uh, common people should have the knowledge and the skills to do their own critical uh, analysis of the information they receive. Uh, we know that uh, many of the information, uh, many of the messages that misleads are easily uh, distinguished, are easily identified as false if people have some basic uh, knowledge. And uh, uh, besides this knowledge, if they have this uh, uh, recurrent preoccupation of trying to understand if it's true or false. Of course, not everything is so easy because we all know about um, deep fakes. So this videos, these sounds that um, can really mislead even the most uh, the people that are most uh, knowingly, the people that have more competences. But if we uh, um, if we uh, really uh, transmit this message to, message to everyone, that is, when they receive a message, they should try before uh, putting trust on it. They should try to verify it uh, with um, trustful sources. Then, um, even in more, um, not to um, to uh, identify. Uh, even there, then uh, people are much more uh, protected. Uh, so uh, empowering people should also be uh, um, an approach and is a very powerful approach to uh, um, protect, to prevent uh, the spread of disinformation. So um, uh, from what I've noted down uh, to other main factors uh, in order to put the balance between disinformation and uh, um, and free speech. So the first one is journalistic media. To get our information, to get the news from a media that uh, follow the, the rules of uh, the journalist. And the second one is media literacy. So the deficit in digital media uh, literacy across the world has been identified, as we said, as a critical factor explaining widespread belief in online false information. Thank you so much, uh, Senator. Yes, May please. I just add something that is uh, yes, of course. The, the, the most um, uh, sometimes it is believed that uh, the easiest way to prevent the spread of uh, disinformation is to uh, restrict, restrict freedom of information. Uh, freedom of expression. Uh, this would be the wrong approach uh, because um, if we restrict freedom of expression, we if we restrict the freedom of the journalists to do their work, in a way, what we are doing is hampering the the, um, the mechanisms uh, to uh, counter this information. So uh, um, to this to uh, complementary approaches that I suggested, I would say that we should also be very aware that uh, prohibition, that restriction to freedom of expression, to the freedom of the media, uh, would be counter-effective to prevent and to combat disinformation. 
Yes, of course, because people would uh, lose their faith in, uh, uh, in societies. Yes, of course. Thank you so much, uh, Sergio Gomez da Silva, for your insights. They were very helpful. Um, so uh, I would like to ask if uh, Maria Spiraki has joined us. Otherwise, we can move on uh, to our next panelist. Um, so uh, I will move on to our next panelist, who is uh, So uh, I would like uh, to go to uh, panelist Rodrigo Naim, who is an awareness director at the SafeNet Brazil. Welcome, Rodrigo. Welcome, and thank you for being here. So um, from, from your experience, is the media literacy education landscape, landscape equally well established in all the countries? And I know the answer, so I'm going to ask another one, another question. If not, what is the baseline of actions that the country should take to create digital literate societies? Opportunity and yeah, it's a it's a really big challenge and yeah, uh, just starting with some past comments about Sergio speaking about democracy and freedom of expression. As uh, well known in Brazil, we face it again in these last elections, really really hard moments uh, with this uh, disinformation strategies. Uh, targeting especially the already vulnerable groups in Brazil, especially, for example, women and, and black communities, uh, participants at the elections that were targeted again uh, online with this uh, process, but also to highlight this impor importance, the importance of this uh, challenge of disinformation also around, for example, during the COVID pandemic and how many families uh, had only the WhatsApp information available for them and through WhatsApp, the same platform, they received a lot of misinformation content about uh, health issues and all these uh, wrong methods that uh, can really, really change their lives and, and make harm, concrete harm also in health uh, uh, approach. So that's, that's to say that the challenge about media literacy is really big in Brazil because even if you have uh, between children, for example, a great uh, internet use uh, for almost 93% of Brazilian children are online somehow, but this access, it's really, really different. And this difference should be considered when you think about media literacy programs. And for example, we have a lot of uh, children in Brazil, the full families that only have access to the internet uh, from cell phones, from mobile phones, and in general, they are limited in access. The broadband is really low, but also they have limits on data package and depends on uh, free platforms. And again, WhatsApp is the main platform because they are free in many different telecoms companies, for example, uh, allow this free access for, for WhatsApp. And again, WhatsApp become the main source of information for many, many families and even for many children that only have this channel uh, to access uh, information. And as Sergio said, the good information, the professional information created by journalists, checked and, and with strong source of uh, information are not always available for them uh, to WhatsApp. That's to say that media literacy is really key for us but also we have to understand this diversity of uh, internet access and also to understand in countries like Brazil and many other countries on, on the table and also on the audience, we don't have the basic literacy, communities that can read, communities that can write. And the same community are using somehow uh, internet and this kind of uh, messaging platforms to inform and to receive information for example, only by audio files. And how can we create 
public policies in countries like Brazil, where we have more than 100 million internet users. Uh, many of them are unlipped, totally unlipped, not only uh, digital unlipped, but we have to think this kind of programs that use different languages to make this different approach to media literacy happens in Brazil, because it's not only uh, checking information, it's not only giving good uh, uh, websites from the ministries of the of formal institutional, but how they can really access this good content and the counter speech of this kind of uh, uh, misinformation strategy. So we are trying to do that in Brazil as SaferNet is running the Brazilian Safe Internet Center. We have in Brazil pretty good laws and guidelines at the national level to to improve media literacy, to talk about this information in schools, in the national guidelines for the national education. We have good uh, 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 guidelines. We have also the Brazilian Bill of Life for Internet that have good principles and really great approach for all these issues. But the big challenge is how we, we implement media literacy education in scale in countries like Brazil and in many other countries that are big and we have a big internet population also. So this scale issue is really key for us. That's why SaferNet as a, a, a technical nonprofit organization are trying to create curriculums. We created a new curriculum last year uh, to share with public schools and make it uh, easy for teachers because teachers themselves are facing the same challenges uh, to understand how to face all this misinformation uh, 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 tsunami, you can say, that are every day arriving in, in many different platforms. So this multi-stakeholder approach, but also this multi-strategy approach, because it's not only schools, we have to work also with uh, the platforms in each country, because it's not only a translation question to translate a, a, a United States approach for media literacy that works well in the United States, it's not the same. It's not only translating a good materials and good tools, but understanding the context, the local context to make it happen. How, for example, just to, to make a short example, how to explain to people how to use the safety features that platforms have for misinformation report, for example, how to report what happens after that. Uh, are these reports anonymous? Can I be a target after after because we have a local uh, repressive uh, uh, militias in my neighborhood. Can I I'm, I'm safe reporting some kind of uh, misinformation in my neighborhood or in my town? This kind of basic information people miss here. So how can we work in these different uh, 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 fronts uh, to have not only schools media literacy approach? educating teachers to have this opportunity to educate uh, children, but also to work with uh, big platforms to make this awareness about uh, resource, about how to report, and also working with authorities. In Brazil, we have a, a SaferNet president. My colleague Tiago is contributing with the Supreme Court uh, for electoral process to work with this misinformation uh, group uh, response to think about how to scale this move uh, uh, in different strategies at the same time that that is much beyond only education and just to conclude we also are working and have good results for for this moment with your participation programs we have new creators online creators and influencers that are creating good materials to face this kind of uh, misinformation, especially related to rape speech, because we have a, a, a strong problem here, a big problem here, uh, how misinformation and all this hate speech are connected. And we are, it's, it's really sad to say that we are starting to have in Brazil, for example, a mass shooting in schools, uh, and almost all cases are related to rape speech and also related to misinformation groups that are uh, 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 targeting, uh, uh, for example, 
uh, uh, LGBTQ new community in Brazil. So it's really hard to see how these high level questions of uh, democracy and misinformation are being translated in behavior from 11, 12 years old teenagers shooting people in schools and using the same discourse, the same narrative that we see uh, on these uh, big misinformation strategies around elections and other uh, uh, hate speech groups. So this is really hard and it brings out our work to your participation to face with your response, not only formal response, it's not only formal education response, it's not only federal uh, uh, Supreme Court response, it's all, how can we engage your participants and your users to say, in your reality, in your community, in your world, how we can face together this misinformation? Because we need these different generations approach uh, to face this problem. And also to conclude, uh, we have uh, seen that it's directly connected all this misinformation, not only with uh, uh, corrupt and democracy, but also the impact on mental health of, of we all, but especially in teenagers also, but also in activists that sometimes are leaving the activism, they are leaving the work somehow. And some 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 persons that are leaving the, the, the elections process and, and giving off just because they are target of so hard attacks uh, of misinformation and hate speech together. And this mental health issue related to misinformation, it's really important, not only for these target groups, but also for uh, everyone, because we know that there are a lot of psychology beyond uh, misinformation strategies and all these emotional effects that misinformation provoke, that even the, the good information to check the information and the counter speech information that uh, correct a kind of misinformation, it's not enough as information only to give back all this the sensation, the emotional aspects and the emotional effects that can be really, really uh, strong uh, provoked by misinformation. And just only one new information, it's not enough to, to take back all this feeling of uh, participating in a, in, a, in a diversity community, in participating in some uh, groups and all these emotional and mental health aspects are really key for us to make it happen as media literacy education in a large approach, uh, not only in schools, uh, but including also other factors and other uh, stakeholders. Yeah, this is how we are trying to face that with this curriculum, this your participation in your creators. We created a small lab, a safer lab project. My colleague Juliana are, are leading, and we have really, really good uh, results. But the challenge is keep to how to scale these uh, interventions, how to scale this good content, and how to scale these educational materials that we have. They are good uh, educational materials, but they are competing as a priority with our educational system, for example, that some schools don't have water, don't have uh, bathrooms, don't have teachers. Mm -hmm. Yes. So kind of competing priorities is also a challenge to scale uh, media literacy and fight misinformation uh, in Brazil nowadays. Thank you so much, Rodrigo, for this input and uh, the insights you gave us about Brazil were really um, intense and very important. So uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult for Greece with 10 million to to raise awareness about digital literacy. I cannot even start to imagine how difficult it's going to be uh, for Brazil, the, the scale of the country, the country is very big. So uh, this, uh, this is a huge project that has to be done because media literacy uh, is the key, um, the key point to many things that are uh, uh, for safety and security online. Um, so, um, thank you so much, and uh, since you have mentioned the youth uh, panel of uh, SafeNet Brazil, I would like to go to, uh, to go now to our next panelist, who is our youngest panelist, uh, Marina Kutivaki, 
thank you once more for representing youth today. You are the voice of youth uh, in this panel, so thank you so much. Uh, it, uh, yes? Oh, no, no, no. Okay, it's, uh, it's always very important uh, to also hear from the youth because they uh, view things differently than us. We think that we can think like a young person, but we cannot, that is the truth. So uh, I'm really curious, Marina, if all these discussions that you have heard today, that uh, uh, all these panelists who have uh, spoken and shared their insight, has it ever been, in, this information, has it ever been in the discussion of your peers? Is it something that young people are discussing, are interested in? Well, <clears throat> from my personal experience and interacting with people my age, I can say that this information is not really a hot topic among us. Uh, well, there are some cases in which this information has come up, but that's always after this information is like uh, revealed or we learn that something we have heard is not true actually. So that's the only way that this information can come to the conversation for us youth. Well, I think I want to say something now about uh, this information and how this information undermines our democratic values and principles. Well, as uh, the previous speaker, Rodrigo, said, uh, obviously this information undermines our principles, undermines our pr principles, but I don't think that something that this is something that youth can understand. Well, I've been here and working with the Safer Internet Center in Greece for five years. So something that I have now understood that this is how it goes, this information can manipulate me. But I don't think that many people of my age or my colleagues uh, and my, the other university students I'm with do understand that and how important this this is well i think that we are very vulnerable to this information maybe due to our lack of experience as young people uh, we don't know how to protect from that and this information can be everywhere from the news to an influencer with hidden at advertisement or anything. So it can be everywhere and we cannot recognize that. There are many cases in which I've tried to, I've tried to make people understand how that works, but it's not very, very easy to understand. So that's why I think education and safer internet education is very, very important actually. Thank you so much, uh, Marina. So uh, from what you say, I can understand that we have to come, uh, we have to present to young people uh, this information a different way as we do it right now, uh, because uh, we are not delivering the message about saying, you know what, this information when is, uh, when is something when something is misleading or not true or false. Okay, thank you so much for this information. And uh, uh, so young people do not care, uh, get the core jit of it. Uh, the threats uh, of uh, democratic values as the panelists also have, uh, um, uh, have shared with us and given their input. And um, how about digital literacy in Greece? Uh, how is it done in Greece? Uh, do you believe that uh, Greece, your country, uh, is a country uh, which uh, incorporates uh, digital literacy uh, in the school curriculum, maybe, or um, provides children and young people with all the awareness material that they need in order to be informed correctly? Well, what I can say about my country uh, is that up until recently, uh, media literacy education was pretty much in existence in Greek, in Greece. Well, lately, the Greek educational system have done something that allows digital literacy to come into the schools and to students. Well, how that works is that, although Greek schools do not have integrated uh, into, into their curriculum such a course as digital literacy, 
Uh, it is one of the most important stuff that children have to learn because they use technology and the social media social media into their daily lives. So how to live, behave, and function in such an environment is extremely important. Well, just recently, in 2022, I think, uh, it, was, it was integrated into the education system a flexible education zone in which educators can select from um, material from various topics. All of them are um, are uh, approved by the Institute of Educational Policy and Ministry of Education. And there is a large pool of uh, themes that can be covered and taught to young people. Well, our Greek Safer Internet Center contributed to this pool of educational resources, a series of handbooks, which are accompanied by a teacher's manual. Well, that promotes values as safety on the internet, uh, proper online behavior, uh, online friendships, protection of excessive use, online gaming, and depending on the age, well, for older students, there are there is material which focuses on hate speech and disinformation, and maybe for younger students in elementary schools, there is a protection of data and all the more basic things. Well, to promote this material to the Greek educational community, a large campaign was initiated by us, the Greek Safer Internet Center, to educate teachers on this material. Well, this material is now used extensively to educate students in digital literacy, aiming to develop responsible digital citizens. Well, still, the material, the material is not incorporated in the mandatory curriculum, and this is definitely one of our main objectives. But I think that, in general, safer internet centers in Europe have a crucial role to play in, uh, in, play in digital, social media, digital literacy, and they have to boost digital literacy education. Uh, well, with the assistance of the personnel of Safer Internet Center, educators have to be trained and subsequently use many multipliers to educate their own students. However, this should be done systematically, I think, and to be incorporated in the mand mandatory curriculum. And for all students, it should be mandatory, starting from a very young age, since the interaction with social media and the internet starts at a very young age at this point. Well, specific focus topics of interest should be incorporated in the, into the curriculum for each different educational level and should be very, very carefully carefully selected by the Ministry of Education, both the Ministry of Education and the Safer Internet Centers. Thank you so much, Marina. Thank you uh, for your input and for your valuable information. You said something that is uh, very important, mandatory curriculum in the schools about digital literacy. This is a, um, I mean, uh, a lot of steps have been taken these last years in Greece. But uh, one uh, more step to take is to incorporate uh, uh, in the mandatory curriculum of the schools digital literacy. Uh, moving on, I would like to go to our last panelist, Samuel Rodriguez de Oliveira. And uh, welcome, Samuel. Thank you for being here. So um, I would like to ask you, uh, how do you policymakers and industry Tackle the problems in terms of legislation. Can you please give Thank us you. one minute? Thank you. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. I think you have um, a small presentation to share. Yes, uh, I do. Um, okay. If, um, uh, can you share your screen? Uh, is it possible? Do you have the rights? Let me try just a second. Can I? I can uh, ask the the team. Okay, great. Okay, is it working? Yes. Yes, it's working properly. 
Um, so uh, I'm going to address how policymakers tackle the problem of disinformation, uh, specifically in Brazil. Um, we have uh, a few um, steps to, to go through here. I'm going to try to stick to my 10 minutes, so I'm going to be brief. Uh, it's just an overview, uh, just some comments uh, regarding uh, a few pieces of legislation and some initiatives uh, of our electoral part. So uh, in Brazil, we have law 2096-5 or 2014. Uh, which is known as the civil rights framework for the internet, which was sanctioned in, in 2014, and it establishes principles, guarantees the rights and duties for the internet use in Brazil. Uh, the global discussions regarding content moderation uh, are reflected in its section three that deals with liability for user-generated content online. Uh, and the law differentiates between connection providers and application providers. While the first group involves the enabling of a terminal to, to send and receive data over the internet, um, it cannot be held liable for damage arising from, from user-generated content. But the second one, uh, the other group involves services that offer functionalities that can be accessed through a terminal connected to the internet, uh, such as social networks. Uh, in this case, uh, the platforms can be held liable if they fail to, to comply with a specific court order. In addition, the platforms are authorized to moderate content according to their own interests and rules or according to the terms of use. And also according to its very own text, uh, this law aims at guaranteeing free speech and prevents censorship, showing a clear preference given to the free manifestation of ideas online. Uh, in practice, it means that companies are not obliged to check and stop content to be posted. And it has clear inspiration on the US model defined on Section 230 of the CDA. And however, we have two exceptions here. Uh, it's when it comes to copyrights and the disclosure of materials containing nudity or private sexual practices. Uh, in these cases, we have a, a notice and take down model that is usually applied. Uh, meaning that an extrajudicial notification is enough to impose liability on the provider in case of non-compliance. Uh, however, the law does not address um, the sharing of misinformation or fake news. Uh, an also important topic is that the constitutionality of its Article 19, which defines the model applied to the application provider, is being analyzed by the Brazilian Supreme Federal Court, uh, which is an issue that has gained traction with intense public debate on the regulation of online platforms in the context of combating misinformation, hate speech, and other forms of harmful online content. Uh, it's interesting also to notice that in 2021, uh, last year, the federal government tried to enact the provisional measure um, 1068, which significantly amended the Internet Bill of Rights to, among other things, provide that social networks could only delete, block, or suspend user accounts and user content if they fit one of the hypotheses defined in a, in a small list that includes, for example, nudity, terrorism, and pedophilia. And notably, this provisional measure did not include the sharing of false information or hate speech in general as causes for the removal of content online. So um, if platforms wanted to delete these types of posts of this type of content, uh, they would have to request it in court. They could not apply their terms of use uh, to the late. I see. Yes. This is a big problem, I guess, if they cannot, if they see this information, they can they're not uh, to take it down. Uh, yes, uh, that was the intention. Uh, and this uh, provisional measure, it, uh, it was proposed by uh, our soon-to-be ex-president, Jair Bolsonaro, which can sort of explain uh, the reasons and and the type of uh, content moderation model that was proposed. Uh, but luckily, um, well, as it aimed to reverse the logic of content moderation, uh, it was deemed um, sort of unconstitutional uh, and also illegal due to the civil rights framework for the internet. So uh, only, at, uh, only a week after its publication, um, this provisional measure was rejected by decisions of the president of the Senate and also by the Supreme Court of Brazil, uh, luckily. Uh, but this year, um, due to this uh, lack 
of a, a legislation that properly addresses um, the matter of a disinformation online. Um, there has been a significant role of our electoral court, our superior electoral court. There was uh, that is uh, the works for um, guaranteeing all the the fairness of the elections in Brazil. So uh, worried specifically about uh, fake news, information, hate speed online. Uh, our electoral court signed agreements with the main social networks uh, operating in the country in Brazil to reduce uh, the dissemination of disinformation with resources that could contribute to democratic processes. Uh, so, um, also, the court uh, has been responsible for re uh, determining the removal of several pieces of content online, targeting mainly those about the credibility of ballot boxes and the electronic voting process in Brazil. Um, and the removal of such content follows uh, the provisions of the court's resolution uh, 23714 that provides for the tackling of information that affects the integrity of the electoral processes. And here in this care code, you can access this resolution uh, in Portuguese, unfortunately, but um, you can maybe use Google Translator or maybe ask me later if you have any, <laughs> if you need any help with this resolution. Okay, we will do that. Uh, and and among other points, uh, this resolution prohibits the dissemination or sharing of known, untrue, or seriously decontextualized facts that affect the integrity of the electoral process, uh, including the process of voting, counting, and totalization of votes. And in these cases, the court can determine the, imme the immediate removal of the content uh, under a penalty of uh, about $20,000 per hour of non-compliance. Uh, and this rule starts counting only uh, as the end of the second hour of receiving the notification. Uh, in addition, this resolution provides for uh, provides that after a college decision establishes a removal of an online content, the presidency of the court itself uh, can determine uh, the extension of this decision regarding all identical content uh, that is found online. Uh, and also, um, this resolution also authorizes the suspension of social media accounts if there is a systematic production of this information online. Um, so uh, following this resolution in November this year, uh, following the Brazilian elections, uh, several profiles of YouTubers and also Brazilian politicians have been suspended uh, on YouTube, on Twitter, and other social media. Um, and although um, these actions may seem unreasonable for, for some people or for some countries, and even to some extent uh, undemocratic, uh, they were deemed completely necessary this year uh, because uh, considering only the first round of elections uh, this year in Brazil, uh, there has been a, a 1,671% uh, increase in the volume of disinformation complaints forward to the court compared to the 2020 elections. Um, there, there, were, there was the need for one, uh, 130 new clarifications and denial about cases of disinformation regarding the correctness of the electoral process. And episode, episodes of political violence via social media increased by 436% compared to four years ago. Um, well, um, Anyway, uh, the way that the Supreme Court uh, has directed its final efforts in the final again, uh, in the fight against fake news uh, has divided some some legal practitioners and academics in Brazil. And, but uh, we have make we have kind of a, an unanimous conclusion that we do need uh, to make all these different all these definitions by due legislative process. So we have we have to have a legislation that uh, addresses all these issues. So um, in this sense, we have uh, our Bill 2630 of 2020 that is known as the Fake News Bill uh, that institutes uh, the Brazilian law of freedom, responsibility, and transparency on the internet that is intended to establish standards, guidelines, and mechanisms of transparency for providers of social networks, search engines, and instant message services over the internet, as well as guidelines for their use. So in this care code, you can access uh, this bill. So uh, it is a text that is largely inspired uh, on European debates, such as the DSA, uh, focusing on procedural obligations. 
it was already discussed in the Chamber of Deputies in Brazil, and now uh, its final text is ready to be discussed in the Senate. So all we can do now in Brazil is hope uh, that this um, legislation uh, be approved or not, and, and then deepen the, the debates regarding how uh, policymakers can address the, the problem of disinformation in Brazil. Um, just a few uh, thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, with DSA, you uh, you are referring to, to the Digital Service Act uh, of Europe, and uh, indeed, it uh, has been also legislation in the European Union. Thank you so much. But it was valuable. It was very valuable to know that uh, it was uh, unanimously a conclusion that uh, legislation is needed, indeed. Um, uh, now I am keen to open the floor to the participants, both from on site but also from online, and to give them the space uh, to uh, um, should, let me share my screen the space to express. Joao, can you hear us from the room from Addis Ababa? Yes, Joao, we cannot hear you. Yes. Yes, now we can hear you. Uh, Joao, so uh, as I said, I'm keen to open the floor to all the participants. And uh, I, I would like to ask, with your help, of course, and your valuable help, and thank you for, uh, for being there today. So uh, I would like to ask the participants, both uh, that are physically on site in the room, uh, but also who are uh, online uh, right now. So how is the media literacy education landscape established in uh, their country? We, we want to know what is done around the world. Uh, uh, we would also like to hear about good practices from their country that tackle disinformation online. And what action points do you think should be followed by the respective stakeholders from public, but also from the private sector. Um, maybe somebody would like to, to join the conversation. Uh, on, and, uh, and I would like to also see um, maybe the, the room, if that is possible from the organizational team, the, the room. Uh, yes, uh, okay, thank you. Maybe I can uh, just uh, uh, say the, the points that I wanted you to, to share with the participant. The first one is, how is media literacy education landscape established in other country of the participants? Um, if they could share with us good practices from uh, their country and how they tackle the disinformation online and maybe action points that they think should be followed uh, by the respective stakeholders from the public, but also from the private sector in order to tackle disinformation online. Uh, I also shared my screen. Can you see the, the, the question that I just posed in your screen? Draw. Great. I don't know if uh, there's online, uh, online participation. Somebody online would like to join the conversation. Um, and maybe share their thoughts. We cannot hear you, I'm sorry. So.
Yes, please. Indeed, thank you so much, Rachel, for this uh, input and for all the information about Kenya. You, you mentioned that media uh, practitioners are getting uh, uh, all the information about digital literacy and the curriculum, but how about uh, young people? How about children? Uh, do, does Kenya have a strategy about raising awareness about media literacy, uh, about safety online uh, in schools? Uh, is there a, a, any strategy there? Do you have a, um, maybe NGOs that are raising awareness? That, that, that is great. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. And uh, Joao, um, I think you said uh, there was another person from uh, on Skype that would like to make a comment. So, yeah, thank you so uh, much, uh, Christian, for your input. It was really important. Uh, I just wrote down uh, about Project Blue Sky, uh, the App Store for Algorithms. I just, I'm just wanting to make clear 
uh, what kind of algorithms are from this are provided from this uh, project? Ah, okay. Okay, so uh, that's why you mentioned the recommender system. So uh, they, co they could pick uh, what uh, recommendation the, uh, the platform would make them well. Uh, that is very interesting. So um, yes, what you mentioned is exactly okay. We have uh, realized that there is a problem. We have uh, informed people that they... Uh, they should be uh, literated from that. That they should um, know about media literacy. They should know how to recognize fake news, so disinformation and misinformation. But disinformation and misinformation is still there. So what can we do? Uh, would uh, any of our panelists like to to answer to give an answer to uh, Christian? Um, May I say something? Yes, of course. Um, I would like to to uh, two, uh, two observations. One regarding journalists and their digital skills. I think this is very important. Um, technology is becoming uh, more and more sophisticated. Uh, artificial in intelligence uh, is already uh, there, and it will increase its sophistication. And it's very important to um, help journalists to deal with this all this uh, all these new uh, challenges. So I think this uh, issue about uh, digital skills of journalists is a really important thing. Another that comes with it um, has to do with um, economical sustainability of media. Uh, we know that. Uh, the way news nowadays um, are distributed uh, is very tough uh, to make sure that uh, everything is correct, everything is fact checked, because we all uh, already got used to receive the notifications in our smartphones. So our expectation as consumers is to receive a notification when, whenever something relevant uh, happens. And um, this is a huge challenge for the media to correspond to this expectation um, and, and also to have all the resources to do it. Uh, and of course, uh, technology is also a way of helping media to, to do face these challenges, but this is very expensive. So um, a thing that needs to be tackled is this um, thing of uh, this uh, economical system sustainability of media. Um, another thing that is um, about this idea of preventing people from being confronted uh, with disinformation, so preventing disinformation or misinformation to reach people. I think in abstract, of course, this is a good idea, but I don't think that in the real world this would ever work. Because in the real world, uh, very often it's quite uh, hard to distinguish what is disinformation of what's not disinformation. And um, what we see in some parts of the world is that uh, the regimes, so political, some political regimes, use this excuse of fighting disinformation and misinformation and malinformation as a way to prevent a free discussion or preventing the scrutiny of their, their exercise they do of, of their power. So I think we should be very careful with the approaches we follow. Uh, let me use this metaphor of the uh, saying, we should be careful not to throw the baby away with the water of the bath. And this is very easy to do. So that's why I think that uh, more than uh, develop systems that will uh, prevent uh, disinformation to reach people, it's better to give people the resources to distinguish what is 
this information, what is false, and what is true. And as I said, I think journalistic information and media literacy are some of the most powerful approaches to do it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. This intervention, uh, Sergio, was very important, actually. Um, uh, from an Internet Society ambassador saying the point cannot be overemphasized that teaching people to easily verify and authenticate news would be the biggest win in combating disinformation. Save a few ones, most disinformation are easily discreditable from publishing sites and running for searches. However, the education will be much more effective if we satisfy users and target them with different approaches. In the long term, countries should consider compulsory digital education from at uh, educational institutes. Thank you very much for this input. Uh, I think, uh, Joao, there is uh, one more participant who would like to intervene. Uh, the floor is yours.
Thank you very much uh, for this uh, input. Uh, indeed, what you said, but also what Sergio Gomez de Silva mentioned that uh, suppressing uh, is not the correct way to uh, to go. So uh, it's also uh, I agree totally with your opinion. So supporting and equipping people is the answer to it, and uh, that is what we try to do also. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I think uh, we have uh, and Nicholas Lenin Anan Agie uh, uh, wants to contribute to the conversation. And this is the last one because we have to close our session. Um, can you open your microphone? You have raised your, your hand. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. I just quickly wanted to highlight a point that the immediate past speaker made on the inherent biases of some of the traditional journalist institutions. And I think that it is widely informed by the country structure. I'll give you a practical example. In Ghana, for instance, for some reason, there used to be only one state broadcaster. And when the media landscape was opened up, political parties bought a lot of the media houses and created a lot of them. And so the media landscape is hugely polarized politically. So in that sense, relying on the traditional media houses to verify information becomes a problem because they themselves sometimes are enablers of some of the propaganda or the disinformation that people fall prey to. So bottom line becomes, as I said, yeah, a unit of the human himself becomes the best judge of what should be true or not, even though in more developed democracies with more pluralistic media landscape, the journalists may provide better insights into the authenticity of information. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we need more pluralistic media landscape. That is uh, very correct. Thank you so much. So I would like to go on and to um, I Sabrina Porbao, uh, uh, co-organizer of this workshop, to quickly inform us about the referendum day celebrations that will follow. Sabrina, can yes, you hear us? Absolutely. Thank you, Evangelian, and everyone um, for this very um, great uh, conversation, very fundamental conversation. And it's so great that we have um, so many participants from different parts of this um, world around the call to really share um, what is um, the situation within their country, their local needs, their local challenges, because this is so important to take into account when trying to globally in a multi-stakeholder manner um, foster and tackle this issue. I would like the occasion at the end of this workshop to make everyone aware about um, Safer Internet Day, which is an annual campaign that is celebrated um, once per year um, in February, of course, we are aware that every day should be a safer internet day. But as with every international celebration, on the 7th February next year, we are celebrating Safer Internet Day again. It's a global campaign that is uh, taking place in more than 40 countries and many more around this world. Um, we invite you all to join um, this celebration um, to mark the state to raise awareness uh, for a safer and a better internet and also to raise awareness about the resources you're producing and the work you're doing at the national level when it comes to tackling this information, but many, many other challenges we, um, we are facing when being online. Um, so I please feel warmly invited to visit our website, saferinternetday.org to see what is happening uh, in regards to this celebration within your country and how you can contribute. Uh, thank you very much for um, joining today and I give the final uh, words to Evangelia. Thank you very much, Sabrina, for informing us about the Safer Internet Day. Uh, I, I would like to close, not to close, I will give the floor to Sophia to, to close the session, but from my side, I would like to thank all the panelists for uh, sharing the thoughts for being here today, for this uh, valuable conversation that we had, and for the reports, of course. Uh, thank you, Joao, for um, facilitating all the conversations from on site, and I wish you have a, a pleasant stay in Addis Ababa. Uh, and Sophia, the, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Evangelia. So, 
uh, we have heard the opinions of our speakers and participants as a, and as a closing remarks of this session. Uh, I would like to stress out some points, some key lessons and recommendations for the future. So Sergio Gomes da Silva gave some examples to demonstrate how fake message circulating in internet and in private groups can interfere in a democratic process. Regarding the balance between disinformation and the right to free speech, Sergio Gomes da Silva pointed out the support to journalist media as a way to avoid giving ground to disinformation, meaning to support good practices as the journalistic deontological code. Another aspect point out was the investment that should be made in media literacy skills in population as a way of empowering them through a critical analysis of the information they receive, meaning give the people the instruments that can help them to distinguish information and misinformation and empower their decisions. Uh, Rodrigo Naim stressed out how WhatsApp can be the only channel to access information for some part of the population in Brazil. Media literacy is a key point, point, but in Brazil, it has to be said that the basic literacy is not ensured. So how can they go further to media literacy? Brazil has good uh, guidelines at the national level, but about, uh, uh, about media literacy, a great approach. But the big challenge is how to scale these guidelines to all population. It was also pointed out how youth participation and influencers are raising awareness about hate speech. All the disinformation is having impact in the democratic process and also impact in mental health of activists and young people regarding emotional effects that the disinformation provoke. Samuel Rodrigues de Oliveira addressed how policymakers tackled the problem and presented the civil rights framework for the internet that includes content regarding hate speech and disinformation online. It was also referred that the resolution that tackles information that affects the integrity of the electoral process. As an example, it was referred that following this resolution, uh, after this year uh, elections, some YouTubers and accounts were taken down. Uh, Brazil is discussion leg legislation that addresses all these issues, and they hope that this legislation will be soon approved. Marina, the youth representative, uh, recognized that this information is not a hot topic among youth. Nevertheless, she mentioned that the disinformation undermines democratic principles, but it's something that for young people is not easy to understand, although she recognize, recognizes how important this is. Youth are very vulnerable to disinformation that can be everywhere, from advertisement, advertising to news. But it is not easy to understand and how to spot it. That's why Marina advocates for the importance of safer internet education. Marina also gave the example of the Greek education system where since 2022 is more flexible and there is a pool of themes that can be thought. Now teachers and students can assess to handbooks and manual about some of the online safe topics aiming to develop digital citizenship. Although it's not mandatory, it's already a step ahead. Marina also underlined the importance of the Safer Internet Center in tackling these issues. Let me end by express my gratitude to all the speakers that gave us their perspective on how to balance the threats of disinformation with the right to free speech, on how online information can undermine our democratic values, on how policymakers and the industry tackle this problem, and last but not least, the example of the actions that countries are taking. Again, I want to thank you all for having been here with us, and I wish you all a pleasant IGF full of useful discussions, gathering food for talks for the next steps for to be taken toward, towards a resilient internet for a shared, sustainable, and common future. Thank you so much.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye.